Um, so, you know, what I'm going to talk about today is actually a little bit of a mix um, uh, between my wearing my clinical hat and what my laboratory does. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to combine a little bit of, of kind of clinical uh, experience with what my laboratory does. Um, and the, I think that the, the really the big issue that we're trying to address is really this issue. And a race, it's really a race against resistant organisms um, that we're seeing in hospitals and, and around the world. So let me try to put this into context uh, and, and talk about what the global problem is with regards to infectious diseases. So uh, about there's about 56 million deaths per year worldwide. And when you break down the causes of deaths worldwide, you'll see that 27% is due to infectious diseases. Only recently did cardiovascular disease surpass this. Uh, but you can see that uh, infectious diseases accounts for a significant portion of deaths. And not surprisingly, when you look into developing nations and look, look to see how it's broken down, 45% of deaths in developing nations is due to infectious diseases. So clearly, it's a huge problem. Um, let's look at what the major, major infectious disease killers are. So if you look here, actually the majority are uh, acute respiratory infections, including pneumonia and influenza, incredibly common things that we think about, but we kind of forget how many deaths and the majority of deaths that are due to this. The blue bar is um, over the age of five, uh, the gray bar is under the age of five. But if you look at this, you know, a lot of these are pneumonias, there's HIV, there's diarrheal diseases, TB, malaria, and measles. And so we know the challenges of HIV, measles, we don't have a lot of good options for, but you know what? The majority are actually curable. So, so why is infectious diseases still such a problem? Just another way to look at it is think about children. So greater than 51% of deaths in children worldwide is due to infection. And again, you can look at in Africa, 77% of deaths due to infection. You can see the breakdown by continents. And here's a statistic that's even more frightening. You know, I think here in the States, when we hear of, uh, you know, a parent losing a child, you know, you know, already our heart goes out to them. But you know what? In some countries, for example, in Malawi, over 50% of the women have lost a child. And those figures are really staggering. Finally, infectious diseases, huge economic burden. So this gives you a sense of uh, when infectious diseases are not controlled, right, this is the cost. You know, 14 billion a year we know worldwide, approximately due to AIDS, and these statistics are a little bit old. Drug resistance here, and this is what I'm gonna talk to you about, is four billion per year in the US due to drug resistance. You can see that we actually save if we can actually control things such like smallpox and polio. Surprisingly, here's cholera. You know, cholera has been around for a long time. Again, we think we control these things, but, but the burden is, is really quite impressive. So what do we do? You know, if I suggest that actually the majority of these are preventable, well, what are the options? We know childhood vaccinations work for a lot of things, bed nets. We do directly observe therapy for things like TB. And here are antibiotics, right? They obviously play a critical role in controlling infectious disease. <coughs> and you know, when did this begin? Well, starting back in 1928, I'm sure you all know, you, you, you guys probably teach this more than I do, right? Since Sir Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin, right, we've gotten to the point where antibiotics have saved millions of lives and eased the suffering of patients of all ages for more than 60 years. These wonder drugs deserve much of the credit for the dramatic increase in life expectancy in the United States and around the world in the 20th century. And that's how we got to the US Surgeon General in 1967 saying, you know what? It's time to close the book on infectious diseases. We can manage them. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is why I think that that's actually not true, right? The Infectious Disease Society of America has basically just de declared we're in crisis. The World Health Organization has declared that, uh, at least with TB, that we're in, uh, we're in uh, uh, an, an epidemic and, and again in crisis. And so what brought us here to 2008 when we thought that we were doing so well in controlling things? Well, I think it's really a convergence, right? It's a convergence of the fact that we continually have emerging and re-emerging infections, right? If we all remember, you know, not too long ago, right? Nobody had heard of HIV, and now look where we are now. Again, you know, within our recent uh, history, SARS, again, nobody had heard of it, you know, and it erupts. You know, what are we looking at? Avian flu, 
Remember when a time when we didn't really hear about Ebola or hantavirus, if you remember these, you know, kind of different cases. And so this is a huge problem, right? Bioterrorism is, is a problem. Again, attention since 9-11. Uh, but here, we're gonna, uh, the, another issue that we're going to talk about is antibiotic resistance. So these are just an example of all the different pathogens that have aris arisen simply since 1977. And, you know, if you look at it, it's really quite staggering, right? And so you, you get a little bit of an idea how, you know, the pathogens seem to be winning. We're kind of losing, and we're always playing catch-up because there's new bugs. And not only that, but the bugs that are out there are becoming resistant to what, how we handle them. So let's look at antibiotics then. So here's a timeline. Uh, above the timeline is basically when an antibiotic or an antibiotic class has been deployed. So here are the sulfonamid, streptomycin, penicillin, uh, tetracycline, uh, cephalosporins, and then way out here are the, really the only two new ones uh, that have been developed uh, since back in the 70s, which are linazolid and daptomycin. And I should say, it's, you know, feel free to interrupt with any questions um, because I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, take those uh, questions. Below the timeline is basically when resistance appeared clinically. And so you can see for every antibiotic that's above the timeline, there's its matched pair. There's not a single antibiotic that we have where clinical resistance has not shown up. For some, we're doing better, right? Vancomycin uh, was first deployed back in, you know, in about the 19, late 1950s. We didn't really see resistance into the late 1980s. But look at the new ones, linazolid, we already have clinical resistance, same with daptomycin. Okay. <clears throat> and so it's not simply, you know, these common antibiotics that we think of using in hospitals and here uh, in, uh, in the U.S., right? If we look at increasing resistance among pathogens that even, you know, we don't consider that we're, we're so susceptible to, like malaria, take a look here, where uh, quinine and mefloquine are, you know, kind of, they used to be at least two of the mainline drugs against malaria, and in Thailand, 45% resistance, right? Here we have TB. 4% is multi-drug resistant. 13% is resistant to a single drug. And we all know now, right, that we're hearing about XDR, extremely drug resistant. What does that mean? That means that the TB is resistant to isoniazid and rifampin, our two mainline TB drugs, plus two other ones that are second line. If you get XDR TB, the mortality is about 80%, right? Once you go through the drugs that we have, there really are very few options. And so I'll say wearing my critical care hat, you know, I've had to tell, unfortunately, a lot of patients and a lot of patients' families, you know, I'm sorry, you're gonna die. You know, your heart is failing. You know, your liver is failing, your lungs are failing. You know, I'm sorry, we don't have any other options. But I'll have to say that the time that I get the biggest shock is when I tell patients or families, I'm sorry, we have no antibiotics left, okay? And it happens. <clears throat> so here, this is to suggest the U.S. is not immune. Two million people acquire bacterial infections in U.S. hospitals each year. 90,000 die of these. 70% of these infections acquired in hospitals are resistant to at least one drug. And as I suggested, it's about $5 billion in cost. This is what it looks like. So here are some of the common resistant bugs that we see in used hospitals. So MRSA, you know, how many of you guys have heard of this term MRSA, right? Methicillin resistant Staph aureus. So back in the 80s, extremely rare, right? The incidence is, you know, a few percent. In hospitals now, we're almost at 60%. And this is continuing to climb. VRE, how many people have heard of that? Okay, so vancomycin resistant enterococcus. Enterococcus is, is, is another, uh, another bug that's actually mainly in our gut. So vancomycin was one of our big guns that we saved as a last, you know, last resort. And now you see almost 30%. Same thing with uh, you know, fluoroquinolone re uh, resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is another horrible uh, pathogen, high mortality. So this is the trend. What is a typical story of resistance then? Right? How does it happen? So let's just go historically. Let's take, let's take a, a, a kind of, you know, a common example, and that is staph, staph aureus, which we hear a lot about in, in, uh, in the news these days. So in the 1940s, right, penicillin was deployed, and you know what? It, ca it kept staphylococcus bacteria under control, right? We could treat it, and people could get better. I mean, this is what happened in war wounds and whatnot. By 1942, so not a lot of time, we started to recognize that there was penicillin-resistant staph. 
by the 19, late 1960s, greater than 80% of staff was penicillin resistant. So does that, is that the end of the road? Well, no, fortunately, 1961, the pharmaceutical companies had made a derivative of penicillin called methicillin that was introduced to combat the resistant staph. And what the issue here was, was that the staph had a beta-lactamase that was hydrolyzing the penicillin, and the methicillin was more resistant to hydrolysis. So unfortunately, by 1974, 2% of the staff is now methicillin resistant. Okay, by 2002, this jumps to 57.1%. Luckily, if we backtrack a little bit, in 1958, vancomycin was introduced. So, you know, it's okay, because we still have, you know, we're scooting along, but we still have another one. Late 1990s, staff is now identified that's partially resistant to vancomycin. 2002, two cases of fully resistant vancomycin resistant staph aureus. And it's not just in hospitals. There's been, you know, maybe you've heard in the news, but people have been recognizing now that there are outbreaks of methicillin resistant staph aureus in the community. It started among you know, athletes and wrestlers uh, and gyms, but now you can see that in certain areas. Here, pe one, people did a, a study of uh, children you know, at one University of Texas hospital, and 70% of them were infected with MRSA. So that's how we've gotten here, where IDSA president recently said, infectious disease physicians are alarmed by the prospect that effective antibiotics may not be available to treat seriously ill patients in the near future. There simply aren't enough new drugs in the pharmaceutical pipeline to keep pace with drug-resistant bacterial infections, so-called superbugs. In other words, we're losing. So remember that timeline I showed you of how, you know, you know, we develop an antibiotic, we get resistance, the next antibiotic is there, we develop resistance, the next antibiotic is there. So can we always count on the next antibiotic being there? And the answer is no. So as I showed you earlier, you know what? There are only two antibiotics with new mechanisms of action that have been developed in the last 40 years. Since in 1998 to 2008, only two, 10 new antibiotics were developed and FDA approved. The majority of these are actually simply derivatives of the old drugs and thus demonstrate cross resistance to the old drugs. It's just new ways to market new drugs. Of t in 2002, among 89 medicines that emerged on the market, none was an antibiotic. In 2004, of 506 drugs in the developmental pipeline, only five are antibiotics, in contrast to 67 in cancer. So this gives you a sense. You know, this number is going down, even as our resistance is going up. So what are the challenges? So why is it so hard to develop a new antibiotic? Well, you know, there's actually a lot of explanations. And, um, and quite frankly, all the major pharmaceutical companies have left or are getting out of the antibiotic industry. So what's one of the problems, right? Unlike a you know, hypertensive, antihypertensive drug, right, that someone takes and they take for the rest of their life, unlike you know, cholesterol-lowering drugs that they take for the rest of their life, you know, if an antibiotic works, you only take it for a short time, three days, five days, seven days, 10 days. Right? Where's the money to be had? There's limited utility, right? Because the resistance eventually develops. So people have studied now that from when an antibiotic is deployed to when we get resistance is like seven or eight years. You know, it takes more than that in time-wise for a company to develop an antibiotic. So you can see that it, you know, the, the economics just don't make sense. It's actually also technically difficult to find, and I'll, I'll show you that in a moment. And the, the, you know, the, again, the, the goal of pharmaceutical companies is to develop broad spectrum antibiotics, right? They don't want to develop an antibiotic for one bug because again, the market isn't there. And you can imagine finding you know, protein targets and enzymes that will cross many different species of bacteria is actually quite challenging. Finally, there's, you know, there are people like me. You know, when a new drug antibiotic comes out, right? I don't really want to use it, right? I want to save it for the really resistant case. I want to save it right, for the cases that I really need and not burn it in other cases. And so even when these companies deploy new drugs, right, th there's an unwillingness to really use them for the right reasons, but nevertheless, it means there's no economic incentive. And so finally, it's very hard. Only f one of 5,000 antibiotics that make it to clinical testing actually end up FDA approved. So 
let's talk then a little bit about antibiotics, why it's so hard, and what I'm going to then shift gears is to suggest, you know what, maybe we need to think outside the box of what an antibiotic is and talk about, you know, are there new strategies that we can think about in combating these bugs? And so let me start with this, which you guys are all uh, very familiar with, but I thought it was kind of a neat, um, a neat uh, uh, video, and that's of the dogma of biology, right? DNA to RNA to protein, right? So here's the DNA. We go along, right? And it's unraveled here. So then what happens, right, is that we start getting RNA, right? So the RNA, the ribonucleotides are added, <coughs> right, by the RNA polymerase, the, the large complex. Here's RNA coming out, splicing. So you could probably know this is actually in a eukaryotic cell. You add the poly A tail. Right, goes out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm where it, hit, get, it finds a, a ribosome. And right, we start making the proteins, right, add amino acids, uh, acids, and it folds, right? And then you can get a lot of post-translational modifications and whatnot, right? This, you guys know. I just thought it was a cool. You know what? It's actually on the web. You guys can all download it. What's that? Do you have an address? I, I, I'm happy to give you guys the address. You can give it to me and Okay. Okay. So, um, all right. So, but why did I show that? I showed that, to, right, because that's the fundamental dogma of how we, you know, we know cells live. So then you have to ask, well, how do, do our antibiotics work, right? And they work simply by inhibiting those really fundamental processes that we know about. So inhibition of DNA or RNA synthesis, right? Essentially, we saw that, right? Anybody know of any antibiotics that work against that? Streptomycin. Well, close streptomycin actually is down here and inhibits uh, protein synthesis here. What's that? Tetracycline. Protein synthesis. So the majority are actually protein synthesis. So what inhibits DNA or RNA synthesis? Um, the main ones that we know are the fluoroquinolones, right? So you all hear about Cipro. Cipro got a lot of press uh, after 9/11, you know, and with the anthrax scare. So Cipro, um, levofloxacin, you know, have you guys ever gotten um, uh, Avalo be treated with Avalox? Those are all the same class, and also rifampin, which is one of the major uh, TB drugs. Okay. The next, as you guys have all illustrated, inhibition of protein synthesis. So streptomycin, all those aminoglycosides that you guys have talked about, uh, gentamicin, you get it in, uh, in the hospitals, tetracyclines, all right, those are all protein synthesis, right? What else do we know? So here, I'll jump in and say inhibition of folate synthesis, which makes the nucleotides that go into DNA synthesis, and that's uh, trimethoprim or Bactrim, right? Anybody been treated for a UTI or something, you get Bactrim. Inhibition of cell wall synthesis, right? Again, you're right, you have to form the cell wall in order for the cell to live. Penicillin. Penicillin, good. Penicillin cephalosporins, vancomycin is that. And then finally, I include this because this is the new one. It's called, it, what it, we think it does, we're not even completely sure, but it's called daptomycin. It's one of the two new ones uh, that have been developed, and one of them seems to depolarize the, the, the membrane potential. The other new one is called linazolid, and again, that's protein synthesis inhibitor. But my point is, is that, you know what? This kills the bacteria and it kills it in a test tube, right? And that's how our antibiotics work because that's how we found them. What pharmaceutical companies did was they screened things within test tubes, quote unquote test tubes, to look for things that would kill bacteria. Then what are the mechanisms of resistance for those? Well, there's two real mechanisms. There's horizontal gene transfer. So we know that resistance markers are carried on plasmids, which then can jump from bug to bug. Right? And those types of markers tend to be things that carry markers that will degrade antibiotics, right? Like cephalos uh, penicillin, right, is degraded. Something hydrolyzes the molecule so that it's no longer active. Things that modify the antibiotics. So, for example, the, the aminoglycosides that you suggested, gentamicin, something phosphorylates it or acetylates it and it's no longer active. Or, as you suggested, tetracycline, something increases the expression of the efflux pumps, so the bug now pumps the antibiotic out and then is safe on the inside. 
The other is chromosomal based, and that is that the bug can simply pick up mutations within the chromosome that make it resistant. And these are the classic ways that TB picks up mutations because TB doesn't really have the horizontal gene transfer. TB doesn't really accept plasmids from the outside, so in order to become resistant to the, to the TB drugs, it has to acquire that mutation within the chromosome. And that's what happens with rifampin, isoniazid, and all of these major, major TB drugs. Yeah? The, you, you talk about these F, efflux pumps that, is there an, a, a regular function for those? Yes, there probably is. Um, people don't know completely you know, what they are, but it probably is to efflux out things like toxins. Right? Because the, the bug will, will, will build up you know, toxic metabolites and intermediates and whatnot. And that's probably what it's doing. So are these very non-specific pumps? Yeah. Right. So pumps that, th they're, so, so one thing you can suggest is, well, can't you inhibit that pump right? and prevent it from set, you know, pumping it out? And that would work if we understood how a molecule is recognized by these pumps. People have tried that. It's in the works but we don't have anything yet. So they're there anyway, even if antibiotics aren't there, bacterial cells all have efflux pumps at all times, is that? So, so, right, so some do more than others. And some drugs are pumped out more than others. So it varies on the drug, it varies on the bug. Okay, so like I said, you know, this is how antibiotics were discovered, right? They would screen, uh, you know, thousands and thousands, and it's pretty amazing if you go back in antibiotic discovery history to find out how, how people discovered uh, antibiotics. I, I'll just, a sidelight, the, one of the most amazing stories to me is Merck. They discovered an antiparasitic called ivermectin. If some of you have dogs, you might, your dogs might have been treated as well because it treats dog worms. The way they discovered it is they infected mice with the worms and took natural product extracts. Not even a single compound, but they took you know, they took uh, streptomyces and actinomyces and got the mixture that comes out of these bugs and put them into mice and just screened these extracts to find for some compound that would cure these mice of these worms. Nowadays, fortunately, there's more efficient ways. And so what, things, what we can do is there's this era of what we call high throughput screening. And so what you do is you have robots and you screen, these are 384 well plates. People can now do it in 1536 and even higher. And what you do is in each of these wells, you have the bugs, and then you put a different compound in each well, and you have a way to track it. So if I have bugs growing in all the wells, but I have one well where there's no bugs growing, right? I know that there was an active compound in there that killed the, that killed the bug, and then I can deconvolute and figure out what's going on, okay? So what are, people ask, well, what are the libraries that these people are screening? Well, there's really three types of molecules that people are looking at these days. One are these kind of flat molecules you can see. Uh, this goes back to you know, your chemistry. There's not a lot of chirality or stereocenters. They're really pretty simple. And you know what? Most of our drugs look like this. The problem is, is that these molecules really target us. They target eukaryotic cells, right? But if you look at antibiotics, you know, none of the antibiotics look like this. All the antibiotics look like this. Look at the complexity of this, which is a natural product. They look like this. So this seems to get into bugs and kill them. How do we get from here to here? Well, it's extremely hard to find new natural products. You know, to find this newest one, daptomycin, people had to screen uh, 10 to the 7th extracts. If you can imagine 384, right, to get to 10 to the 7th, right, you're saying you're going to screen 10,000, 100,000 plates. And that's really not doable. So there's a new effort among synthetic chemists, right, and these are the ones that I interact with, where we're trying to make synthetically molecules that look like that, right? And so there's this new uh, category of molecules. The problem is you can argue, you know what, these guys have had natural selection. These are made by bugs out in the environment in the presence of other bugs that they're trying to kill. Right? And so the, over the time, they've evolved, so they make the right molecules that kill, whereas these haven't. The answer is, is still out. We just don't know. OK. So in this screening, then, you know, what are the approaches? You can imagine there's basically two. There's what we call target-based and whole cell screen-based. So what is target-based? So target-based is um, 
is this approach now in the post-genomics era, where we know the whole genomes of these bacteria. And we can now go, at, go in and ask genomically, what are essential genes, right? Can we find, you know, this RNA polymerase we identify is essential, and so we're going to try to target. If we can inhibit that, we can kill the bug. And that's one approach where you take the protein, now you screen in this high throughput format for small molecules that inhibit that protein, that inhibit that enzyme. The second approach is a whole cell approach, and that is to say, you know what, I don't know what a good target is. You know, RNA polymerase, it's essential, but you know, can I in fact find a small molecule that will inhibit it? If I inhibit that RNA polymerase 99.9%, maybe the enzyme is still good, that it'll work. And so it's not realistic to be able to target those. And so what you do is you take the bug, you treat with a small molecule inhibitor, and look for a change of phenotype, in this case, a dead cell, to say, you know what, I'm not going to assume anything I know about targets. I'm not going to assume anything I know about the targets, the enzymes, or the genome. I'm just going to get the phenotype that I want and then try to figure out what's going on. And so that's exactly what, what the kind of the, the error that we're in now is to ask, can genomics help us? So if we take a whole cell screen, we get a small molecule inhibitor, and now we kill the bug, can we go from killing the bug to actually finding what the target is? Because if you can do that, then the chemists and uh, structural biologists say, well, we can get a crystal structure, figure out how the small molecule docks, and figure out how to make a better molecule based on how it's docking in so that it's more potent. We can discuss this later if you guys are interested, because it's really a theoretical question. Do we need to, in fact, know the target? People argue now, right now in the pharmaceutical industry, don't worry, I will get to the academic side of things. Um, people argue in the pharmaceutical industry that you need to know what the target is in order to make a better molecule that's, that's potent enough to actually be an antibiotic. So the question is, how do you go from here? How do you go from uh, um, a molecule that killed the bug to finding its target. Any quick ideas? Yeah. Right? It's like finding a needle in a haystack, right? There's however many, you want to say 4,000 proteins in the bug. How do you find out? Whoa. Trial and error. What's that? Trial and, Trial and error. error. So that's actually what people are doing to some degree now, right? We can now make libraries where we overexpress all 4,000 and ask that question. Right? There's another way that we can now do it, technology-based, right? Generate the resistant mutant, right? If you have, you know, a point mutant that now, you know, creates a, um, a places a different amino acid, right, in the active site of an enzyme so that the inhibitor can no longer bind, right, that thing becomes resistant. Now I'm simply going to sequence the whole genome and look for that mutation. And that mutation is going to be in the gene, right, that this targets. We can do that now. We've done that. Um, so we took Vibrio cholera, and we generated resistant mutants to rifampin. And in three weeks, we had gone from the start of the experiment to identifying that RPOB, RNA polymerase, is the target of rifampin. Something that used to take 20 years, if ever, we can now do in three weeks. OK. So that's how things are done in industry now, right? You either screen against a target or a whole cell. So has that gotten in us anywhere? It sounds really good. So GlaxoSmithKline uh, recently published their uh, experience from 1995 to 2001. And if you're interested in this kind of thing, it makes for a great read, though a very depressing read. Because what they showed is they did 70 chemical high throughput screens of about 260 to 530,000 compounds per screen. They targeted 300 genes, three whole cell screens. And you know what? They had no viable candidates at the end. I recently talked to the, uh, the, the guy who's actually now at Merck who, who wrote this, and they spent $150 million and came up with nothing. OK. So that's where we are. And now let me shift gears into the kind of the academic setting and ask, you know, are there ways to think outside the box? Are there new ways to approach this problem? So I would start with this premise and say, you know what? We screen to kill bugs in a test tube. Is that really what we care about? I would argue that what we care about is this. We care about the patient with cholera. We care about the patient with TB or the patient with hospital acquired <laughs> infections. That the behavior of a bug in the patients is not the same as in a test tube. And 
it's not that simple because when we screen in a test tube, we ignore the patient. We ignore the host. So what I'm trying to argue is, you know what? The interaction between the host and the bacterium is actually extremely complex. Right? We know that there's an immune response, and actually the immunologists have done quite a bit to elucidate what's going on. We know if you get an infection, the, the human host, presumably the, the immunocompetent human host, will have some immune response to control the infection. We also know, and again the immunologists have done a lot to show right, how the bugs actually stimulate the immune response in the host. What we know much less about is this inner part. And that is, how is the bug actually virulent? You know, how is the bug actually you know, killing the host? You know, what is the, how is it causing tissue damage? We know in some cases, right, that, uh, for example, vibrio cholera, we know it makes a toxin. You know, anthrax, we know it makes a toxin. But quite frankly, we don't know how the toxin is killing human cells. We know even less about, you know, once the bugs are in the host, what is it about the host and being within the host that induces the bugs to start their, their virulence cascade? So what I mean by this is if you imagine Vibrios, right, out in flooding season in Bangladesh, when they're out there, you know what? They're not making toxin. They haven't started, they don't turn on their virulence cascade. So the question is, what is it about it when you ingest into the human host, in the human gut, right? There's something about the interaction with the host that causes it to turn on that virulence cascade. We don't understand that, but you could imagine if we did, and we could break that connection so that you can ingest Vibrios, but they don't turn on all their virulence factors, right? You wouldn't get disease. So the point is, is what we really care is about infection. And so, like I said, it's actually an extremely complex process, right? The bug has to encounter the host. So in this case, I'll show you, this is a white blood cell. Uh, it's actually a macrophage. These are red blood cells, and this little thing is a bacterium. Right? They have to encounter, right? if you want a successful infection, the host has to encounter the pathogen. It has to, the pathogen has to enter, it has to spread, it has to multiply, it has to cause damage, and then eventually it has to be transmitted. You know, that's an extremely complex program for a simple bacterium. And it all has to be extremely tightly regulated, right? You don't want to damage, right? start making your virulence factors if you're the only one. Right? because you just can't cause that much damage. And in fact, the bugs have this phenomenon called quorum sensing, where they sense how many people, how many of their brothers are around. And they only turn on their virulence factors when enough of them are around. Right? So it's extremely tightly regulated. And so this relationship is also extremely complex. So here's the macrophage, right? The fact that it even knows where the bug is as the bug is moving, right, is an extremely complex process. You can get this too. You can get this too, right? And you'll see what happens. It eventually engulfs it. OK. So you can see that what I'm suggesting is there's this complex balance going on between the host and the pathogen, right? What, you know, you don't have to kill the bug. The question is, can you simply, you know, shift the balance towards the fa in favor of the host and then the host can actually clear, right? And if you suggest that that's possible, then there's several strategies you can imagine. One is antivirulence, right? And this is what a, a little bit to what I referred to, right? Cholera toxin. If we could inhibit, right, the ability to make cholera toxin, then we basically have disarmed these bugs. And then, would they, then they wouldn't cause disease. Can you count on the human immune system to clear it, right? And you don't really have to clear, kill the bug with the actual antibiotic, right? You might have less generational resistance because the selective pressure is not as strong. What's another approach? Well, another approach is a bug requires functions when it's within a human host that are not essential in a test tube. What's a classic example? Iron. You know, when you grow bugs in media in, in a test tube, and maybe you guys have all done this in your lab with your, your students, you know, the media is really rich. It has everything it needs to grow. But that's actually not the case in a human host. You, you know, in, in the human host, a lot of bacteria are iron limited. And they've actually evolved all these mechanisms to scavenge iron from the human host so that they can survive. Right? So you can imagine if you could inhibit these iron scavenging uh, functions, right, yeah. the bugs couldn't survive. And so you could kill it that way. 
Here's another strategy. Can you target the human host? Right? Could we somehow upregulate the human host and immunity to help clear? And then finally, there's this other option that actually one of you actually already suggested. It's can you figure out ways to overcome resistance? So <coughs> let, me, let me put that in a different way to look at this, you know, this kind of uh, schematic of what exactly goes on with the host pathogen interaction. Right? What are the possible places we could actually disrupt this interaction and actually intervene? So remember from the, 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 the little video, right? The bugs move. They have to move, right? And usually they move towards something, right? It's called chemotaxis. I'm sure you guys all know about that, right? To get to the right place, right? To adhere. So for example, again in the gut, right? Vibrios have to, and salmonella, oshigella, all of these guys have to swim to the surface of the mucosa and actually adhere uh, as the first step. Then, at some point, they have to sense when to turn on virulence, as I described with, uh, with, uh, with vibrio cholera, right? There's some cascade that goes on. Eventually, if a toxin is made, you have to actually deliver the toxin into the host. If the toxin goes into the host here, right, can you inhibit that toxin function? Or as I said, can you inhibit in vivo functions or host response? And so, let me talk about one example to suggest that, you know what, antivirulence approaches might be possible. So let me go back to this example that I've described a little bit with Vibrio cholera. So what do we know? That during you know, flooding season, uh, Vibrios persist out here uh, in the environment, um, and they usually live in what are called biofilms. And I think uh, Roberto Coulter already spoke to you guys a little bit um, and perhaps mentioned biofilms. Um, I, I should mention, you know, put this in context, that most Vibrios actually live in these clumps of biofilms. And so there's, a, there's an investigator named, named Rita Caldwell, which has shown that if you simply take this water and filter it through sorry cloth, you know, just a couple layers of cloth, you actually reduce Vibrio uh, cho uh, cholera incidence by to about a third. So it's not insignificant. All right, but anyway, you, you orally ingest these clumps in biofilms. They have to pass through the gastric acid barrier, where, where somehow, we don't know how, the bugs exit the collection of bio, in the biofilm. They go, they swim, and colonize the intestinal epithelium. They multiply. They express these toxins, cholera toxin, and this what's called a toxin co-regulated pilus. And we believe the pilus is required for adhesion to the, uh, to the mucosa. And then eventually, right, you have the, uh, the secretory diarrhea, uh, that allows the bugs to enter uh, uh, the environment for another uh, infectious cycle. And so what we did is a little bit like, you know, that high throughput screening that I showed you to look for compounds that would kill antibiotics. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail, but we did a screen not looking for compounds that would kill the bugs, but that would inhibit expression of cholera toxin. Okay, we went on to show that it actually inhibits a uh, dimerization of a transcription factor, which is required to turn on uh, uh, transcription and expression of the toxin. But basically, uh, the question is, does it work? You know, can you work, does it work to actually help clear infection? So we went to an animal model. And the way this animal model works is that we take infant mice. So if you take here Vibrios and you orogastrically inoculate into infant mice, and then you let them uh, basically colonize and infect for 18 hours, then you cut out their intestine, grind it up, and plate it out on LB streptomycin, you can count how many Vibrios, right, were actually in their intestine. And so if you, for example, if you uh, infect with um, a Vibrio that's uh, missing the cholera toxin and the toxin corrated pilus, when you do this experiment, you essentially don't get any Vibrios back, right? They don't colonize, they don't infect. So the question is, if you infect these guys and you add this molecule that we found in vitro that inhibits cholera toxin expression, what do you think will happen? So we did that experiment. And here's what it looks like. So S533 is a control Vibrio strain. So we wanted to make sure, and, and the S533 is a Vibrio which causes infection but is cholera toxin independent and TCP independent. These are very rare strains, um, but basically they don't use this mechanism, so this compound should have no effect on S533. So here's what it looks like in mice. This is log of CFU recovered. So this is where we uh, infected them and just gave them controlled DMSO uh, buffer boost. But here's what it looks like when you give them uh, this compound and we boost it every eight hours. You can see 
no effect. This is what happens when you take Vibrios, which colonize and infect in a cholera toxin TCP dependent manner. Here is again the control DMSO buffer. Here's what it's like when you give this drug. With the exception of two mice, we couldn't recover any bugs. So this is really kind of the first proof of principle in a whole animal model that shows, look, if we simply disarm the bugs, you know what? Then our immune system can actually clear and we can actually have an impact on infection. OK, let me tell you briefly about in vivo essentials. I'm not going to have you know, great stories, because I hope I'm, I, you know, a little bit of these are all works in progress. These are all ideas people are exploring now. But let, let's talk about in, in vivo essentials. Um, uh, right, so how do you find them? Right, if you just grow bugs in a test tube, right, you can't figure out what are in vivo essential genes, right? People are doing it using genomics, right? But how do you, how do, you do it if you want to look for small molecules that target these in vivo essentials? You got to look in the whole host, right? That's the only way because that's the only time they're essential. So what people have done is they're actually working to develop whole organism screening models. Right? I described the ivermectin case uh, with Merck back in the 1950s and 60s where they screened in mice. I can tell you that doesn't fly anymore. There, there's too many, I mean, you, you can't go through 50,000 mice. So you need a surrogate, right? You can't screen in humans. I'm telling you, you can't screen in mice anymore. So tissue culture, okay? So if you can do it in tissue culture, you have a certain cell type, but a certain cell type does not substitute for the whole immune system, right? So you got to find something smaller that fits in these plates. So here's two examples. C. elegans, nematodes, and zebrafish, okay? What's the comparison? C. elegans, a whole lot easier to work with. Zebrafish immunity is a whole lot more like mammals. These are vertebrates. Their immune systems are remarkably similar to humans. You know, they have, they have, uh, B, cell, they have uh, uh, B cells, T cells, macrophages, neutrophils. They have complement. They have adaptive immunity uh, as well as innate immunity. These guys' immune systems are really close. But let me talk about C. elegans because it's easier, and that's what people have done first. So this is what a screen looks like. It's done high throughput. So we're talking, you know, 50,000, 100,000 of these little wells. You can't do it by eye. So people have written programs to teach computers how to read this. So this is what it looks like. Here's C. elegans, and they treat it with Enterococcus faecalis. If, it, if, the, if the worm dies, you can see it becomes this rod. Right? And there's the programs that basically will, you know, you, you take the image mic microscopically. There's actually a lot of work we ask the computer to do to get it to an image that we can actually read. This is what happens, right? If you take C. elegans and you infect with Enterococcus faecalis, but you know what? You put ampicillin in the well. Ampicillin kills the Enterococcus, and you can see that these guys are still sinusoidal. They can still with swim, and they're still alive. So what you ask for a computer to do? is to pick out these wells where you introduced a compound, right, that will, that will rescue these against infection. And that's what people are doing now. And people have found ones where you get hits, you get compounds which have no activity whatsoever against Enterococcus faecalis in a test tube, right, but they work here. Just, uh, just quickly, you can imagine, just so you know, you can do this with zebrafish now. And this is one of the things my lab does. Right, so this is what it looks like. Pseudomonas originosa, uh, most resistant gram-negative pathogen in hospitals, uh, accounts for 90% of the deaths in cystic fibrosis patients. All right, is the major gram-negative that accounts for deaths in chemo uh, patients undergoing chemotherapy, uh, transplants, immunocompromised patients. So just to give you a sense of what this looks like, if we take Pseudomonas originosa, we introduce a constitutive GFP, so we can actually follow infection. So what we do is we micro-inject the pseudomonas with GFP into them. This is four hours post-infection. This is what happens at 19.5 hours. Here's 24 hours. We can watch in real time as infection is occurring, right? And so we can also put small molecules. We can put anti-pseudomonal uh, um, uh, pseudomonal antibiotics in here and rescue them as well. This is just a control to show what if you do heat-killed pseudomonas, you have no effect on the, the embryo. Okay. 
So that's one way to get at in vivo essentials. What about the host? So the host, the immune system is pretty amazing if you think about it, right? I mean, it's amazing that we're not all sick all the time. Here's the, the example that I want to use is actually TB. So, you know, if, you, if you're exposed to TB, right, what often happens? If you, uh, as, as high school teachers, do you have to have PPDs checked and whatnot? Okay. So did you know that a third of the world is infected with TB? Right? But you know what? A third of the world doesn't have TB. About, there's about 8 million uh, uh, new cases each year. About 2 million people die of TB each year. And so people look at this and think it's really horrific. And it is horrific. But you know what? The amazing thing is that a third of the world has it. 90% of people are completely asymptomatic. The immune system is really good. So the question is, can we figure out and learn what the immune system is doing, right? Can we find small molecules that will help us modulate that? So in TB, the main mediator of immunity is actually the macrophage. So what happens is, you know, the macrophages go, they phagocytose bacteria. And most bugs, right, it works pretty well. What happens is the macrophage engulfs the bacteria into a phagosome. The phagosome fuses with the lysosome, right? And in that fusion, you get the phagolysosome where, you know, it's acidic. You get reactive oxygen species. You get NO, and that kills the bacteria. That's not what happens with TB. So what happens often with TB is you get phagocytosis, but there's something about TB that inhibits fusion with the lysosome, and so TB can replicate here. Can we exploit that to manage infection? So again, what's a, a, what's a, a type of approach? This is TB, okay, again, with GFP. So we can follow where the TB, live TB bugs are. The blue are the nuclei of the macrophages. So this is what it looks like under a microscope in one of these 96 well plates. You lay down macrophages, now you treat them with TB, right? And you let it go, and what happens is these, the TB replicates. And that's what the GFP is. It's replicating TB. If you put in TB drugs into the well, what happens? You kill all the TB, right? And you have nice, happy macrophages. So the blue are the human cells, the green is TB. So in the same way that I was suggesting that you can do microscopy to look for the effect of nematodes, you can do this to TB now. And so we've done this as well. And you can basically look for small molecules, right, mi microscopically, that will generate this phenotype and you ask the microscope to find you the compounds that do that. And I can tell you that, you know, we've, you know, you can see, you can go through 100,000 images, it, you know, it, it's, it's actually, this is not, this is not, the technology is somebody else's development. You know, we're just trying to apply this to infectious disease, but it, it's staggering what they can do. So what we have done is we've started to find small molecules that modulate the host. Okay, this is not targeting TB, but they're modulating the host to help the macrophage basically control TB infection. Okay, uh, you know what, because of time, I'm actually gonna skip the anti-resistance part of it, um, but simply to say, you know what the strategies are now is simply, right, can we tip the, the balance in favor of the host, right? and intervene. There's a lot of growing evidence that says that we can, and that simply going back to those strategies where GlaxoSmithKline spends $150 million and finds no lead, right, is what causes everyone to get out of the field. Um, and that puts us in the, predic the predicament that we're in. So, you know, it, it, we're trying to think outside the box. So, um, you know, it's really, I make it sound so dire, right, that we're really kind of at getting towards the end of the line. And, you know, many of us are nervous, but let's not forget the fact that antibiotics do work. And so, you know, I try to end this on a good note. You know, this is someone uh, with HIV. This is six months later. Antibiotics work, right? It's simply how do we find better ways to find them so that the bugs don't keep winning. So just quickly, you know, folks in my lab, many of who have contributed to, you know, the, the, some of the technology and stories that I've been alluding to, um, and finally, most of all, all of you for uh, not going to Al Gore's talk uh, and coming here. Um, and I'm happy to take questions.
talk a little bit about overusing antibiotics. Yep. So, um, um, there is, um, there is, you know, the CDC monitors this, um, and something like 70% of prescriptions that are written are unnecessary. Still 70%. Yeah, 70%. And so is that a huge problem? Yes. Do we have the data to show that definitively? It's not so easy. Right, so unfortunately, you know, a lot of it is anecdotal because it's hard, it's hard to do the study that shows so clearly. Um, but we clearly show that in, in, in places where there is more liberal use of antibiotics, the resistance is much worse. So areas of greatest antibiotic resistance are areas such as Asia, where you don't need a prescription to get an antibiotic. So a lot of the resistance that is appearing isn't necessarily even engendered in the United States where 70% of prescriptions are not necessary, are inappropriately prescribed, right? Uh, fluoroquinolone resistance in parts of Spain and Portugal are much, much higher than here. But you can imagine in this era where you know, travel is so simple, right, that things move. Um, and so, for example, uh, it used to be that gonococcus um, in the U.S. was, again, very sensitive to all antibiotics. But in Thailand and in East Asia, phenomenal amount of resistance was generated, and now we're there as well. Um, uh, you know, another really classic case is, I don't know if you guys have heard about this very resistant Acinetobacter in hospitals. So there's this very resistant Acinetobacter, which is one of those where we have no antibiotics. Uh, what we've done is we've gone back to these very, very old antibiotics that were shelved because they were too toxic, right? And that's the only option we have. Where did they come from? Where did it appear first? It appeared first in soldiers who went to fight in the Iraq War. It appeared first in hospitals there because the incidence of it is much higher uh, in the Middle East, again, where the use of antibiotics is different uh, than here. So. That's a problem, and you know, education is, you know, is paramount, and you know, that's the effort that has to go out. You know, it, it's problematic because many, um, many um, uh, uh, daycare centers will allow a kid to come back if they're on antibiotics, right? So parents go into the office, and people have done these studies. If a parent walks into an office asking for antibiotics, their chances are much greater of walking out of the office with a prescription than if they don't. Right? And so what happens there is the, the incidence of penicillin-resistant pneumococcus, of, of cephalosporin-resistant enterococcus, is much higher there because of that use for ear infections and whatnot. Yeah. As, um, as bacteria are developing immunity to different drugs, are they losing their immunity to old drugs? In other words, could we bring back the sulfur drugs say and maybe have a shot with those? That, that's a great question and the answer is it depends. So unfortunately there are these plasmids now, right? I told you it's horizontal gene transfer. These plasmids carry resistance markers to four or five drugs. So when you pick up one and you select it with erythromycin, you know what? You've selected for sulfur resistance, you've selected for clindamycin resistance, and it all comes in one shot. So that's that's so in those cases, you can't, right? There are efforts in other, you know, but it's hard to control it nationwide. There are efforts, for example, in hospitals to rotate antibiotics, right? To say, you know what, I'm gonna control it and only use this antibiotic, but you know what, after a short period, I'm gonna switch to different antibiotics so I don't really select for that, right? And continue this movement, right? So that you don't end up selecting for a large population. But it's tricky and it requires really concerted effort. Yeah. Um, what about antibacterial soaps? Do they work? Is that what you're asking? Or? Being used too often. Are they problematic? Do they work? Well, you know, yeah, no, I know it, it's controversial. Um, do they work? They work, right? So if people can do the study, right? I mean, you guys can do that, right? Where you use it, and you'll see that if you plant it, you'll get lower CFU. Those antibacterials, in general, tend not to be the same antibiotics that we take systemically, 
right? So do you get resistance to those compounds that are in the soaps? You do. Does it cross with being able to treat someone with a real infection? It doesn't. So it depends on, on how you want to look at it. Yeah. How is the agricultural use of antibiotics affected? It's a very good point. It's a huge problem. And some people would argue that that is the fundamental problem. Because people um, have, uh, will treat their, uh, their cows and whatnot with fluoroquinolones. And that's actually a lot of the, a lot, that's probably where a lot of the resistance is being generated. So you're absolutely right. That's a huge factor. Um, the, uh, the, the FDA and you know, Department of Agriculture and all of those are trying to begin to regulate that. And they've been, tr they've been trying to develop antibiotics that can be used exclusively in animals that doesn't cross over into the human population. But that's a great point. With the use of antibiotic soaps, is there a danger that there'll be a plasmid with resistance to the antibiotic soap and the resistance to several medicinal drugs? And I always tell my students not to, that they shouldn't use them. You know, it, it, it's, it's a theoretical risk, but it's never happened before. So, you know, it's hard to say. Those, those, again, it varies on what the antibacterials are, right, and the mechanisms by which resistance is acquired. So I can't say no. Usually triclosin. Right. right, so triclosin, right, and there is, and there's resistance to triclosin, but there's never been any evidence that it's been picked up on a plasmid and that it's been, that it's been uh, uh, horizontally being transferred. Is it just a matter of time? It, 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 it could be, right, I, I can't say. Um, the 90% of the one third of the people that are <coughs> on TV that aren't that aren't aren't symptomatic. What is it really just the immune system that's keeping it down, or is there anything else that maybe you know sort of what the whole lecture was about basically? Is there anything else that's going on in the body that that could be used somehow to to keep TV? Yeah, you know. I, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I wish I had the answers because this is, you know, it, it's actually unfortunate that we know so little bit about TB despite how old it is. Um, you know, to give you an example, you know how we diagnose TB? We diagnose it using a smear that is the same way that Robert Koch discovered it over a century ago. So, so with that caveat, I mean, people are trying to discover. So is it purely one's immune system? So, you know, people, we can now do what are called genome-wide association studies. So you've probably heard about genes that people are finding associated with like Crohn's disease and autism and whatnot. So people are trying to do these same studies to ask, is there something intrinsic about one host versus another, right, that makes one person predisposed as opposed to another, right? Are there other factors? So, you know, one type of study actually uh, brought out this issue of vitamin D. And so people have suggested that vitamin D is required to help with the immune response to TB. And so there are actually now trials going on, right, to give vitamin D. And it's interesting, again, anecdotal, right, because the way people used to treat TB was to send people out to, right, sunny areas, sanatoriums, outdoors, right? Who knows? But those are the things that people are looking at. Yeah. Uh, the allergy to antibiotics, is that something that you're talking to about that? Is that an innate, not innate, but is that overexposure to a certain? It, it's probably not overexposure. It's probably um, something genetic about the folks who have allergies. And so that's exactly what we're hoping, you know, the era of uh, you know, personalized medicine is that you know, if we can find the markers that confer sulfur allergy you know, and you have everyone's genome, you know, I don't want to get into the ethics of that, right? but that's potentially one benefit, is that can you then you know, pre-select out folks who are going to have sulfur allergies and know that you should not give it to them? Yeah. Another question that goes back into the um, PowerPoints you showed. Does 70% of the kids at the Texas hospital, were they carrying versus they had their nose, or did they have active urine? No. Carried it, colonized. And where do they keep it? Where is it? Is it? So the main place where we colonize staph aureus, you know, it's, it's actually on our skin. It's everywhere. But the main place is the nose. So there, I mean, there, again, there are trials to, for people to eradicate that. Um, and sometimes it's effective, sometimes it's not. 
Thank you.